Uh, yesterday I, I gave you a um, fairly highly prepared talk uh, because I felt it was important to try to condense what objectivism was and uh, what its intellectual influence was. This morning I, it will be somewhat more informal uh, and I want to leave uh, quite a bit of time for, uh, for discussion. I'm, uh, let, me, let me start with a few caveats. Uh, I believe in the brochure this was described as a talk about the objectivist movement and my place in it. Uh, this makes me intensely uncomfortable. I <laughs> uh, uh, am somewhat diffident about um, assigning any place to myself. I don't think that's my business to do. I that will have to let the marketplace of ideas uh, or history, if that's not too grand a way of putting it, decide that. Uh, what I will talk about are what I think um, some of the things that movement has to do, what some of its goals should be, and as it happens, these are goals of my organization. So. It will give me a chance to talk about uh, the Institute for Objectivist Studies. Uh, also, I feel, uh, um, I always feel a little awkward uh, talking in public about the objectivist movement because it has been a rather small movement and there have been and many of the internal goings on have the character of uh, family squabbles. Uh, I don't enjoy airing dirty laundry uh, or engaging in name calling or talking about individuals. And speaking as I am to a European audience, I feel especially um, uh, awkward about this because I imagine that from the perspective of um, a transatlantic perspective, uh, these things look even smaller than they actually are uh, in the US. And I must say, uh, particularly since we have people here from Eastern Europe, uh, I imagine that for people who have just escaped from hell, many of the things I'm going to talk about will seem especially petty. Uh, so I'm not going to dwell on them, but I think it might, uh, I gather it is of interest, and uh, I think rightly so, uh, to know something about how the objectivist ideas emerged and were uh, organized as a movement. Perhaps it will tell us something about the nature of movements in general. And also I would like to talk about uh, what I see as the future of the movement. Um, I've always, I always enjoy talking about the future. <clears throat> as a philosopher, uh, I feel on safer ground um, when I'm not bound to historical fact. Uh, so, uh, but I do think it's there, there some interesting questions about how intellectual um, uh, movements, intellectual life can be organized. But as I said, let me start with a brief kind of review of what the objectivist movement is and has been. Uh, Ayn Rand published her major work, Atlas Shrugged, in 1957. I would say before that there was no objectivist movement because there was no such thing as objectivism. In the sense of an organized systematic philosophy that had any kind of public identity. <clears throat> During the 30s and 40s, uh, Ayn Rand was very active as a writer and to some extent as a political speaker and uh, activist. Uh, she published her first novel, We the Living, in, I believe it was 1936. It was published in England and then in America. Uh, at that time, uh, partly as a result of her book, which was a very stinging uh, portrayal of life under the communist system, uh, which was published at a time that we in America refer to as the Red Decade, when um, so many intellectuals were communist or, or fellow travelers. Partly as a result of this, she came into contact with a number of the other thinkers uh, in the United States who opposed the communist system uh, and, but perhaps equally importantly, imposed the drift toward a socialist um, uh, state in the United States, the, the Roosevelt era, the great the New Deal. Uh, Ayn Rand worked on the campaign in 1940 of Wendell Wilkie, who was, um, uh, the, uh, ran against Roosevelt. And she did so because she felt that the New Deal was destroying what was left of American freedom. Uh, she published The Fountainhead, as I described yesterday, in 1943, and this brought her even greater fame and, and 
part, again, it, it uh, uh, furthered her, her contacts and work with um, conservative spokesmen. At that time, there was no real distinction between conservatism and libertarianism. The concept of libertarianism it really had not emerged. There were just people who favored free enterprise, uh, were opposed to communism. At the time, Ayn Rand was uh, clear in her own mind that her ground for opposition was quite different from those, uh, from that of, of some of the people she was working with. Uh, but it had not been developed out into a systematic philosophy. Uh, and The Fountainhead itself was not really a political novel, although it had political implications. It was much more a personal story about an individual creator and the meaning of individuality and individualism in, a, in an individual person's life rather than in a society at large. But with the publication of Atlas, uh, she had developed a systematic philosophy touching on all the major areas of philosophy, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, uh, as well as political philosophy. The novel was overtly political. That is, it was a novel about the decay of a political system. It was a kind of anti-utopian novel uh, on a large scale. And at the same time, Ayn Rand uh, identified herself as a non-conservative. That is, as someone who advocated freedom, capitalism, individualism, on grounds other than religion or tradition and became a very vocal uh, uh, critic of conservatism. She had a f falling out with William Buckley, uh, the conservative founder of the National Review. And uh, uh, her book was really trashed in Buckley's magazine. I won't repeat some of the things that were said about it, but it was, it was uh, very much below the belt <laughs> sort of review. That was the point at which the objectivist movement, I think, can be said to have begun <clears throat> in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Her work attracted many readers who not only enjoyed the novel and took something from it personally, but wanted to be involved in, in what they saw as a potential for changing the world, changing the culture and the political system by means of these new ideas. In the early 1960s, Nathaniel Brandon, who was a uh, close friend, and as we now know, something more uh, of Ayn Rand's, founded the Nathaniel Brandon Institute in New York City, which began offering lectures and courses and social occasions. It became a mini university, a, a free university in the proper sense. Uh, that is the non-leftist sense. Uh, in New York City and thousands of people over the years took courses either in New York City or um, by a system that I, as far as I know, Brandon invented of, of uh, tape, sending tapes around the country for groups to listen to. Uh, there was a great spirit of a new age dawning uh, during this time. There was a great positive spirit that these ideas were so good, so right, and had been put so well and persuasively in Atlas Shrugged and in the nonfiction essays that Ayn Rand was writing that it wouldn't take long for them to sweep the country, change the culture, and um, bring back uh, capitalism and the gold standard. Many people lost money uh, investing in gold. <laughs> uh, the movement acquired its name, objectivism, and uh, it uh, had, became the subject of a great deal of media attention. Uh, reporters were noted the phenomenon of Ayn Rand's uh, novels, uh, sparking so much interest among students, especially in um, college students. There were groups on many of the campuses. Ayn Rand herself did a great deal of speaking on college campuses. Uh, and so, as I say, there was a great spirit of a, uh, of a new age dawning. At the same time, there were problems. The kinds of problems, I think, that are not really endemic to objectivism, and as I was suggesting yesterday uh, in answer to one of the questions, the problems to which the content of objectivism as a philosophy, I think, holds the cure, so that to some extent these things over time could be expected to be self-correcting, and uh, I think they are in now in the process of being corrected. Uh, the problems are probably not unknown to you, so I won't dwell on them, but they include such things as a tendency toward uh, rigidity and closure to new ideas. The sense that 
this was the new truth and it was the whole truth. I've always uh, felt it's important to draw a distinction in my mind between um, uh, subscribing to a philosophy in the sense of believing that it is wholly true and subscribing to a philosophy in the sense of believing that it is the whole truth. And I think that distinction is a mark of the difference between a, having a rational systematic philosophy uh, in the one hand and having a religion or a dogma uh, on the other hand. Uh, it's a tremendous danger sign when any movement uh, takes the attitude, we have nothing to learn from anyone else. Um, because what that really means is um, and claim we have nothing to learn. It's all known now. Uh, another unfortunate feature was a concern about purity, ideological purity. Again, this is nothing new. Every movement in intellectual movement in history has run into this. Uh, and it's been much, a much more virulent um, problem on the left, I would say, than, than on the right. Uh, and on the right, it's not limited to objectivism. Uh, all of you who have been around libertarian circles know that uh, there are many gurus who are very just as concerned with ideological purity uh, as objectivists ever were. But it is an unfortunate fact, and it, uh, it was present there in the movement. There was a certain uh, tendency to turn the truths of the philosophy, the principles of the philosophy, into dogmas, into formulas. Uh, and a certain lockstep kind of thinking in which uh, it was um, one ceased to expect um, uh, discussion and debate uh, except on, on marginal issues of interpretation. Uh, there was a phenomenon, I sometimes joke that uh, <clears throat> at times Ayn Rand would have a new insight or one of the other founders would have a new insight and, uh, and then thousands of objectivists would have to be recalled for service work on their beliefs. Uh, <laughs> but there, there was some of that. Uh, Another, and this I think was extremely unfortunate, uh, a tendency to identify the philosophy with the people who led it and to identify the future and the interests of the cause of the ideas with the interests of the individual um, leaders with Ayn Rand and, and her inner circle. Uh, so that anything that, the, the way to promote objectivism had to be to promote her or her ideas. Uh, uh, our, people were uh, roundly criticized, people who went out into uh, ac an academic world or the political world of journalism espousing some of the new ideas that they had learned. And uh, that was fine, but if you failed to cite Ayn Rand, it was um, regarded as a very large black mark by many people. And if you came back and said, well, look, it, it just, by the standards of this profession or the standards of academic scholarship here, it wasn't appropriate to cite it. Um, I was using an idea, but it was too amorphous to um, uh, cite. They, they, it was often argued, well, you, you should have cited her anyway. You should have gone out of your way because, after all, the best thing we can do, the only real thing we can do is to get her name in, into print and in public. So as I said, there was this, this aspect of identifying the interests of the ideas with the interests of the people. Uh, and finally, the, as, a, as, a, as a part and parcel of all this, a certain spirit of authoritarianism in which people felt uh, not free to question and challenge uh, ideas for fear of being drummed out, not free to express some of their artistic preferences that um, uh, were unusual, for, let's say, for objectivists, not the ones, not the standard kinds of aesthetic preferences. Uh, people felt sometimes. Uh, very intimidated about, about uh, saying they like this or that artist whom Ayn Rand didn't like. But all of these were problems, I think, that were, um, first of all, as much the result of the kind of people who were associated with Ayn Rand and attracted to the movement as they were her problems. In fact, I think she played, uh, was not really the primary source of them. And I should also say that these problems were just that. They were problems on a movement that did a great deal of good, uh, invented a number of new ways of getting ideas out to the public, and was uh, a very fertile period for the development of the objectivist philosophy. Uh, virtually all of non Ayn Rand's nonfiction writings were uh, done at this time in the objectivist newsletter, the objectivist magazine, and then the Ayn Rand letter. 
uh, and her spe in her speeches at Fort Hall Forum in Boston, where she spoke every year. So we owe to this period the um, a great deal of the intellectual development of the movement and also the um, um, political activist um, practical level of organization. At the end of this, at the end of the 60s, as I'm sure many of you know, there was a falling out between um, Brandon and Ayn Rand. Uh, the objectivist movement split into warring camps. People on opposite sides stopped speaking to each other. Uh, many people simply threw up their hands and left the movement in disillusionment. And I think, in a sense, the movement, uh, the internal movement of objectivism, the movement of people who call themselves objectivists, has never really recovered. Perhaps it never should, it should not have recovered. Perhaps it was not fully healthy um, to have been that tightly organized. But uh, although it did, to some extent, in the 1980s, um, recover a bit. The 1970s were a fallow period. Virtually nothing happened. Ayn Rand continued to write. The people associated with her continued to write and to uh, um, deal with each other as friends or as colleagues in, in various individual pursuits. But there was no really organized vehicle, no institute, no association, uh, other than Ayn Rand's publication, the Ayn Rand Letter, which published only her own writings. There was no publication. Uh, it was also a, uh, a very politically disappointing period in, in the United States, and I believe the same could be said of Europe. It was a period when uh, the broader free market movement was developing intellectually, but had not reached the political level yet and had very much influence. And so in the United States, um, uh, we, had, we were in the unhappy position of accepting as our warriors people like Richard Nixon, uh, Gerald Ford, uh, pragmatists of, of the worst kind. And I think many of us uh, who were objectivists at the time, remembering the spirit of a new age uh, at an earlier time, felt, and this is a great line from one of Don Henley's songs, I always think it's very clever, um, felt that uh, the, the new age is dawning on fewer than expected. <laughs> uh, we wondered what happened. In the 1980s, uh, there was, to some extent, a rebirth of, a rebirth of the organized objectivist movement. <clears throat> uh, something called the Jefferson School uh, was begun in 1983. This was a summer uh, conference, uh, which continues to meet every other year in San Diego. It was organized by George Reisman, an economist, and Edith Packer, uh, his wife, who is a uh, psychotherapist, and it was a chance for for the intellectuals who, during the preceding ten years, had developed their their ideas and um, moved into academic life to come and lecture and for people to gather together again. The Ayn Rand Institute was formed in 1985. This was an organization that um, uh, was formed after Ayn Rand's death to promote her ideas and uh, folk concentrated on. Uh, getting her ideas across to students, uh, high school students and college students. Uh, book services sprang up. There were several newsletters. And there was also, I believe, it, a, a certain spirit of renewal and openness. Uh, 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 at least I thought at the time. Um, it turns out I was partly mistaken in this, um, but not wholly mistaken. There was a spirit of the, the doctrinaire, somewhat dogmatic, closed aspect of the movement in the 60s had been a mistake and that we wouldn't do it again. I actually, I'm sure I remember now that the word tolerance was often used in a positive sense, uh, on occasion anyway. Uh, there was a great deal of talk about encouraging spontaneity. Uh, there was a recognition that many of the attitudes and policies of the movement at an earlier time had encouraged repression. Uh, psychologically, the spirit of uh, repression, and that was something that we had to overcome. There's a great deal of concern for individuality, that people who accepted the same philosophy uh, didn't have to all to be friends. They could have friends who didn't subscribe to the philosophy, and they didn't all have to wear the same clothes or <laughs> like the same movies, uh, um, and they didn't even have to like the things Ayn Rand liked. Uh, the great symbol of this was, uh, Ayn Rand had one, at one point, uh, I remember commented on 
the kind of dancing that was introduced in the 60s, the rock and roll dancing, as jerk and moan dancing. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it was a sign of liberation, I think, at some of these conferences to when people um, dragged out their rock and roll music and got on the floor and jerked and moaned for a while. Uh, however, this was a, um, turns out, only a partial reform, at least from my point of view. In 1986, Barbara Brandon published her biography of Ayn Rand, which I'm sure many of you have read. Uh, a biography which uh, was written by someone who knew Ayn Rand intimately over a period of years. Uh, was basically, as far as I can see, having read the book, was basically a, an admiring biography. Indeed, by the standards of contemporary biography, would have, would, by many, intellectuals be considered a shamelessly admiring biography, but how, was critical of many aspects uh, of, of uh, the objectivist movement and also of Ayn Rand herself. And also told a story of uh, an affair which apparently had been kept secret um, uh, between Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon over those many years. An affair which in retrospect did seem to explain an awful lot uh, of the animosity um, looking back on that time. Well, this was a real crisis because there were people who could accept this and people who couldn't. Uh, and it was the source of the beginning of my own difficulties with uh, the other um, leaders of the movement. Uh, there was for a long time what I consider to be uh, stonewalling about admitting the truth, basic truth of the uh, events told by Barbara Brandon. There were many uh, bizarre arguments invented to, um, at first, to argue that this was, we should, this had no testimonial credibility, whatever. It's now everyone admits that it was true, this affair. Uh, but many people regarded uh, this book as a work of malice because it criticized Ayn Rand in the way that it did. Um, I did not feel that way. Uh, I didn't agree with all of it by any means. Um, and I thought some of the points were not well substantiated. But uh, I thought it was a pretty fair shot. At the same time, I, to, and here I have to continue speaking about myself because this most recent split was, <laughs> did involve me. Uh, at the same time, it seemed to me that there had been, uh, there was a change of foot in the libertarian movement. Um, uh, during the early, its early days, uh, as I think I was saying yesterday, there were uh, a great, I think there were a great many problems with it and a great many things that made me, along with most other objectivists, want to keep our distance uh, from it. For that reason, and also because I was, during the 70s and early 80s, concerned with my own um, philosophical writing, I didn't have any involvement really. But I was writing political commentary, and in the course of that I was constantly speaking to uh, free market oriented people. Um, uh, at the Cato Institute, at the Institute for Humane Studies, at other public policy groups that were springing up like mushrooms, people who could give me good journalistic information on topics I needed to write about. Uh, when Reagan got into power, I found that I could find almost any piece of information I wanted by calling around in the government because the government was being infiltrated by free market economists uh, at the lower levels, but um, when you're a journalist, you learn how to get to those people. Uh, and so I began to sense that a, there was a movement away from the, the idea that political change would come solely by activist um, um, election, electioneering, trying to get people elected. A lot of pe people were losing interest in the Libertarian Party, per se, not because they were losing interest in libertarianism, but because they were seeing that you had to work at many, many different levels and change ideas and change policies and incentives of a kind that are not uh, amenable to to uh, direct election. And also, I think there was a, a very much a renewed appreciation for Ayn Rand in particular and uh, for the role and importance of philosophy in general. Uh, I began to hear people telling me, you know, for 10 years I've been making economic arguments and they're all valid, but they just won't work. They won't do it. We've got to make a moral case. And you know, Ayn Rand really had it right. I began hearing this over and over again from people who had, were familiar with objectivism, were part of that much wider movement of people who never attended NBI lectures uh, or never attended more than one, uh, but who were deeply influenced by the novels, by the ideas who had been touched and, and changed by them. 
And these were people who had gone off and developed careers uh, in law, journalism, economics, or whatever. And we're now coming back to Ayn Rand and saying, well, this is, um, this is good. So I felt, fair enough, I'm certainly prepared to meet people halfway. Uh, and I began uh, doing some speaking to libertarian groups. Uh, and it turned out, um, somewhat to my surprise, that this was uh, also, like the Brandon book, a cause for um, uh, uh, vilification, uh, on a cause of, of uh, great antipathy on the part of some of the other leaders of the objectivist movement. Uh, it seemed to me, it seems to me ironic that uh, at the, just as I think the libertarian movement was, was getting back on its feet and becoming a much more solid intellectual movement, um, a major, what is now considered a major work in the objectivist movement, a work by Peter Schwartz called Libertarianism, uh, came out which uh, trashed the entire movement and tried, <clears throat> seems to me, tried to accuse, uh, engage in guilt by association, uh, all, everyone, accusing everyone of, uh, in the movement of uh, the sins committed by a relatively, what at that time, by then, were relatively few and, and flaky people. Uh, it reminds me of the definition of fanaticism, of a fanatic as someone who redoubles his effort when he has lost sight of his goal. Uh, much of this would have been very timely 10 years earlier, but was uh, uh, beside the point and unfair at the time it came out. At any rate, this led over time uh, to a, a parting of the company between me and um, many of the other leaders. And not just me, there were uh, some of the um, other intellectuals who had been active and speaking at uh, objectivist conferences came with me. We founded uh, the Institute for Objectivist Studies. Uh, and this was a year and a half ago, finally, we founded this, uh, which is now a um, organization based in New York, uh, which is in the business of promoting the study and development of, of objectivism. I'd like to talk a little bit about its goals. Um, by talking about uh, what I see as the future of the movement because I think uh, the goals of the organization are precisely to foster the movement. Uh, and so I've had to do quite a bit of thinking about what the movement needs in the future if it's going to succeed. And here, let me say, I think there is a fundamental problem that arises for any kind of intellectual movement, any kind of organization within an intellectual movement. It's a conflict between the integrity of the ideas and the independence of individual people. If you're going to have a movement uh, to promote certain ideas, to try to get those ideas accepted and developed further, you do have to take some care that it's those ideas that are being promoted, not other ideas. You cannot open your doors totally to um, any idea that comes along and says, well, that's fine. Okay. If you do, uh, then there's nothing left. You have no content left. If you're not, and it's the old um, law of, uh, in philosophy, there's, there's a philosopher Spinoza uh, came up with a statement, all, all determination is by negation. That is, to have an identity, to be something, is at the same time not to be something else. And this holds for ideas. To believe A, you really do have to say, not A is false. Uh, for a philosophy, um, it's important to preserve some kind of integrity of the ideas. It's also important to preserve certain intellectual standards. Uh, the intellectual world has developed various standards of, of rigor, clarity, originality, and you, if you're promoting, particularly promoting a new set of ideas, you want to try to meet the highest standards because you've got an uphill battle to fight. You want the best exponents, the clearest, most logical, most knowledgeable exponents. And that means choices. That means saying you're in or you're out. But on the other hand, a movement, particularly a movement of individualists, cannot be organized in any authoritarian fashion. And it can't be organized in terms of dogmas. Individuals who are going to participate must be free to understand the ideas on their own, which means inevitably, as part of the process of understanding, asking hard questions, playing devil's advocate, uh, exploring connections with new ideas, even with, with, with other non-objectivist ideas, uh, even if they turn out to see that those connections uh, can't be sustained. 
learning is a process in which, uh, learning uh, like discovery, I would say, is a process in which there are no holds barred. You do anything that works and you sift it out later. Uh, but any kind of constraint or demand that you not consider this, not read that, uh, that this is not an objectivist idea so you can't explore it, uh, this is death to independent thinking. This is a conflict then between the integrity of the ideas and the independence of people. It's a problem that has arisen whenever intellectuals have expounded any view. Uh, it arose for Marxism, for Freudianism, uh, for pragmatism even, even so loose and soft boiled the philosophy of pragmatism had this problem between William James and uh, Charles Sanders Peirce who at one point were not speaking to each other. Uh, my, my way of approaching it is to think that it's important to distinguish a movement from an organization. If, an, if a movement is is so small that a single organization can dominate it or represent it. It really shouldn't be called a movement. It's, uh, it's just an organization. I think objectivism is past that point. I think it is um, uh, an idea that has reached thousands of people and uh, uh, is going to have to be promoted by not thousands, but at least numerous different organizations. An organization will organize itself for a specific purpose and define its standards and uh, will commit itself to, to pursuing those purposes as best it can in accordance with the standards, but recognize, have to recognize that there are other organizations pursuing ideas within the same movement uh, and, and uh, not try to claim um, hegemony. The only cases in which an entire broad-based movement, I think, uh, has been represented by a single institution are either religious, as in the Catholic Church, uh, or totalitarian, where typically you have a party that represents the ideology and is the final say on what the party line is. But neither of these is a very appealing model for um, secular individualists. So, I've tried to define as specific a purpose for um, the Institute for Objective Studies as I can. Um, let me just say a few words briefly about what, what the purposes are. One of them is the intellectual development of objectivism and the communication of it in the academic intellectual world, uh, which includes work with graduate students, training them in the philosophy and uh, uh, helping them to enter the academic world. I think that objectivism is the only systematic, fully integrated philosophy in the classical liberal camp. And I think it's important to develop this philosophy. Uh, not, not everyone who is a classical liberal is an objectivist or would want to consider himself an objectivist. That's certainly true. Uh, but I don't think there is as any alternative philosophy that is as well worked out and as widely known um, as objectivism. Uh, Hayek's philosophy, I think, is a rival in terms of its state of development, but it's not, it's in many ways very idiosyncratic uh, to Hayek. Uh, but the objectivist philosophy, in my view, is uh, very far from being completed. I'm not even sure it makes sense to talk about the completion of a philosophy, but certainly this one isn't. There are many questions that have not been addressed or resolved, uh, both questions of detail of the kind that scholars are concerned with uh, and questions of application of the kind that um, other people are concerned with, like what are the implications of the objectivist ethics for families? Or how do we integrate it with some of the new um, interesting ideas in psychology? Uh, what, are, what are it bearing on legal problems? And so forth. All of these things need to be developed and, and worked out. Uh, secondly, I think uh, uh, it's important to try to get objectivist ideas out to as wide an audience as possible. Uh, the objectivist philosophy, the, the theory of how history moves, is that uh, ideas have to change before you have any long-term enduring change in an economy or, or a political system. You have to have a society in which people largely subscribe to certain values. Not in a religious sense, but in a broad, in a broad kind of sense uh, that, we're, that for which the model, uh, best model in my mind is the Enlightenment. 
when you had something that was broadly speaking a movement and was considered at the time by the people at the time to be a movement of ideas uh, people identified themselves as of the enlightenment uh, but it was broadly defined in terms of certain key values such as reason and the belief in, under, in first hand understanding and individual rights and so on and so forth uh, I believe in the United States, and I imagine this is true in, in Europe as well, that there are a large number of people who are still basically Enlightenment people. This includes most libertarians. Uh, I think it includes a lot of modern contemporary welfare state liberals uh, who are wrong politically and, can, you know, but who are, uh, um, have some kind of connection or, or are reachable on the basis of certain basic values. And I think that um, uh, the act of trying to get after them and convince them is, is an important one. In this connection, I'm, I'm all in favor of the widest possible cooperation with the libertarian or the classical liberal movement. Uh, you know, I, I always insist that I'm an objectivist and uh, I will always argue for the truth of objectivism. Um, and uh, so I'm not a relativist in that sense, and I don't believe that uh, you can, over the long run, organize a, a purely political movement. I think it always has to be rooted in some sense of values. But I think that there are many people out there who are um, open to those values and, uh, and also have something to teach me and objectivists about uh, aspects of human life that maybe we haven't thought about enough. So uh, I'm... Um, now operating on the assumption that uh, people in, that I come across are innocent until proven guilty. Uh, some do prove themselves guilty, but it's much fewer than my former colleagues uh, used to imagine. Finally, there are uh, many people who do call themselves objectivists and, and for whom objectivism is both a guide to life, not only in politics, but in their personal relationships, uh, their work, their families, and also an intellectual structure that they use to integrate their understanding of the world. Uh, and we are in business also to serve their interests, to uh, have conferences, lectures, and uh, uh, publications that deal with the issues they're concerned with and allow them to uh, uh, discuss and debate many of the applications of objectivism uh, to the issues that they're concerned with. Now, I have... Uh, brought brochures for my organization, the, which I've put up front. Um, I know a number of you have expressed an interest in finding out more about us and uh, getting on our mailing list. We, so please feel free to take one. Um, if you would like me to add you to our mailing list, um, please, some of you have given me your cards. I have a pad of paper there. You're welcome to uh, um, leave me your name and address, and I'll make sure you get information. We have a journal, a newsletter called The Journal, uh, which goes out to our members. Uh, which contains information about what we're doing and also some of the, some excerpts from talks and conferences that we sponsor you might be interested in as well. So let me end there and, and thank you all for hearing me out and I'd be happy to take any questions.